torque converter. Looks like I'm going to have to get out my tech reference book and bone up on just how a torque converter works. I, uh... Hey, snap out of it, boy. Let's head for home. Say, what's wrong with you, anyway? Uh, I've been trying to remember just how a torque converter works. Art's going to tell us about the new engine-fed torque converter tomorrow, and I thought that... Why, man, you're looking at the champagne torque converter, man, bar none. Oh, brother. Okay. Explain it to your old buddy, Kenneth, expert. Gladly, my boy, gladly. First, you remember uh, the impeller, don't you? That impeller is the veined section that forms the rear half of the sealed converter unit, right? You're on the right track, Ken. Actually, that impeller is bolted directly to the crankshaft plan through the converter unit, so it can rotate with the engine like a flywheel. Now, let's add the turbine which is splined to the turbine shaft. That turbine is similar to the impeller, except for the shape of the vanes. This turbine is mounted inside the converter unit. Then it rotates entirely independent of the impeller. That's right, Ken. Power flow out of the converter to the rear wheels is through the turbine shaft, the clutch, and the transmission. What about the stators, Bill? Those stators are mounted at the hub between the impeller and the turbine and turn independently. Let's take a look at the power flow through the converter. Remember, the engine drives the impeller. Oil is thrown from near the impeller hub outward through the impeller vanes. The faster the engine turns, the greater the force of this oil being thrown out through the impeller vanes. As this oil leaves the impeller vanes, it strikes the turbine vanes. When the engine speeds up fast enough, the force of this oil becomes great enough to turn the turbine and move the car. Now, the oil striking the turbine vanes gives the turbine a push and keeps right on pushing it as it flows inward toward the turbine hub. Hmm. Then I suppose that oil has a lot of push left in it when it leaves the turbine. Right, Ken. And harnessing the push that's left in the oil is the secret of torque multiplication. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess... Keep talking, Bill. Oil leaving the turbine is redirected or turned by the stator vanes so that it'll strike the impeller vanes again, giving it an additional boost in the direction of impeller rotation. It's easy to see how the oil, by getting this extra boost, keeps speeding up and getting stronger until the push or torque on the turbine is several times greater than engine torque. Just how much does this converter step up engine torque, Bill? It may go as high as two and one-half times engine torque under some conditions, like uh, uh, starting up fast from a standing start. Well, since you've got the action of this converter down pat, let's get a running start for home. Tomorrow, when Art gives us... So this is the new engine-fed torque converter, eh? Right, Ken. Bill tells me you both understand how a torque converter works, so we'll start right out by talking about the features of this unit. You'll notice that this converter has fins on its rear outer surface. Those fins are there as an aid in cooling the oil. Say, that's a good idea. Hey, wait for me, Art. Looks like I walked in on something that's right down my alley. Oh, hiya, Tech. You're late. We're just getting started on this engine-fed torque converter. Glad to have you join us. Thanks, Art. Uh, uh, go right ahead. First, we want to remember that this converter gets its oil supply from the engine. The engine oil pump, in addition to supplying oil to the engine, also keeps the torque converter full all the time, under a pressure of about 20 pounds. Let's take a look at this oil pump. The engine oil pump on the eight-cylinder job is located in the oil pan and contains a combination pressure regulator and internal bypass valve. On six-cylinder jobs, the pump is externally mounted and incorporates a bypass valve in the pump cover. Bypass valve, hey? What does it do, Art? That bypass valve permits recirculation of the oil within the pump rather than allowing that oil to be returned to the crankcase. On six-cylinder models, 
The regulator valve in the side of the block permits lubrication to the main oil gallery when the filter element is plugged. Now, to get into the oil system of the converter, here's what happens. Oil enters the unit from the rear of the engine main oil gallery. From there, it passes through drilled passages in the adapter and the converter housing and into the converter. Erect, Art. Oil enters the converter through a metering orifice in the hub of the reaction shaft. Metering orifice, eh? How come? That's so you can maintain normal oil pressure in the engine and at the same time control the oil flow into the converter. Now, a portion of the space between the turbine shaft and the reaction shaft is blocked off by two rings to form an oil cavity. So after leaving the orifice, oil flows into that cavity. There's only one way the oil can get out of that cavity. Right, Tech. And that's through drilled holes in the reaction shaft. Oil flows through these holes and fills the converter. Once inside the converter, the oil is thrown from the rotating impeller to the turbine to transmit the engine torque to the rear wheels. You already understand that. Now, since oil is constantly flowing into the converter, it has to have some way to flow out. So when the oil pressure in the converter reaches 20 pounds, it flows out through a drilled hole in the turbine shaft, which leads to a passage inside the shaft. Right, Art. Oil flow is now toward the rear, through a passage in the center of the turbine shaft, to a ball-type regulator valve at the rear end of the passage. That's a pressure regulator valve, right? That's right, Bill. This valve holds the oil pressure in the converter at about 20 pounds per square inch. When oil pressure exceeds 20 pounds, the ball is pushed off its seat, and the oil is allowed to flow past the valve into other drilled holes near the rear end of the turbine shaft, just beyond the rear oil ring. Now you can see the reason for that metering orifice in the inlet passage, Ken. That I can, Tech. If this regulator valve relieves at 20 pounds, and there was no other restriction, oil pressure to the engine bearings would never get higher than 20 pounds. Right. Now, from the pressure regulator valve, oil flows through passages in the housing and the adapter plate back into the engine through a return opening in the engine block. Right, Tech. When the oil reaches the engine, it enters a vertically positioned pipe and returns to the oil pan. This pipe extends almost to the bottom of the pan. What's the reason for this pipe, Art? It's to eliminate oil foaming, Ken. By passing the oil into the oil pan below the surface of the oil, foaming is eliminated. Say, what about capacity and weight of oil for these jobs, Art? And before you get into that, somebody better turn this record over. Well, the total capacity of the combined engine and torque converter oil systems is 13 quarts of the same weight oil as specified for the engine. What's the story on changing oil, Art? That's an important story, Bill. And on cars equipped with the engine-fed torque converter, it's quite a different story than we've been used to. The oil needs to be changed only twice a year, in the spring and fall, or as seasonal temperatures require, Bill. Hmm, twice a year, eh? That's quite a bit different than our usual recommendations. Yes, it is, Bill, but the important thing we want to remember is that the oil filter needs to be changed at least every 5,000 miles. But it isn't necessary to change the oil every time you change the filter. Is that what you mean? That's right, Ken. Stick to seasonal oil changes, but keep changing that filter at least every 5,000 miles. And a man who drives his car 30,000 miles a year would have to change his filter six times, or change his oil only twice. Is that right? That's it, Ken. Let me add this. You fellas know the conditions in your territory, and you know how your owners drive. So, if there are any unusual conditions, you may have to change the filter more often than every 5,000 miles. A point about that filter. If you change the filter at the same time you change the oil, you'll have to put in 13 quarts of oil. Remember, the normal capacity for an oil change is 12 quarts, but the filter element and its lines hold about another quart. 
I suppose you guys can count up to 13 without taking your shoes off, can't you? <laughs> we'll try awfully hard, Tech. Just how do you drain the oil from this torque converter, Art? The first thing to remember, Ken, is that you have to drain both the engine and the converter, and you drain them separately. It makes no difference which one you drain first. You can see that if you drain the engine only, the converter would remain nearly full. So drain the engine in the normal manner. Here's how you drain the torque converter. First, remove the plate at the bottom of the housing. Then rotate the converter until the drain plug is at the lowest point and remove the plug, allowing the oil to drain. And due to the fact that the converter is a sealed unit, it'll take a while for the oil to drain out. Let me add a word of caution here. The oil may be pretty warm, so be careful not to get burned. Now, after all the oil is drained out, install the plug using a new gasket and be sure that plug is turned in good and tight. What do you mean, good and tight? What he means is tighten that plug to its torque specifications, 45 to 50 foot-pounds. Don't forget, there's a lot of pressure in there, and you can't have any leaks. You said that the engine and torque converter together used 13 quarts of oil, Art. You pour it in all at once? Yes, you do, Bill. Pour all of it in the engine. As soon as the engine is started, the pump will pump the oil into the converter. Run the engine at a fast idle to be sure that the engine oil pressure is higher than 20 pounds. That's so the regulator valve in the turbine shaft will move off its seat and let the air out of the converter. It'll take about five minutes for the engine oil pump to fill the converter. Before you drive the car, Check the oil level to be sure the level is between the add oil and the full marks on the dipstick. That's a good point, Tech. What about service diagnosis, Art? That's a good question, Ken. To produce the maximum efficiency, the oil pressure in the converter must be maintained to at least 20 pounds per square inch. If any excessive slippage occurs, indicated by poor acceleration and high engine speed, it could be due to loss of oil pressure in the converter. You say excessive slippage. How can you tell whether the slippage is excessive, Art? The only way you can tell is to compare the performance of one car against that of others you have driven, equipped with this type converter. When you've had a little experience in handling these cars, you'll be able to tell whether a job is performing right or not. Right, Art. That's the only way to tell, by comparison. Loss of pressure in the converter could be caused by foreign matter on the regulator valve seat, which prevents the ball from seating properly. A broken regulator valve spring could also cause slippage. Broken spring, eh? Let's see. That'd mean disassembling down to the regulator valve in order to replace the spring, wouldn't it? That's right, Bill. You'd have to remove the transmission and the clutch to get at the end of the turbine shaft, which contains the regulator valve. And when you've done that, you're ready to remove the plug which holds the valve in place. And you remove this plug with a special plug puller tool. After the plug and ball are removed, examine the ball seat in the turbine shaft for score marks. If you do have to remove that valve, better play it safe and put in a new ball, spring, and plug. You have to use a special tool to control the position of that plug when you drive it in. If you don't, you'll affect oil pressure. And here's something else to remember. If you leave the car standing for several days without driving it, some of the oil may drain out of the converter. In that case, you might get a whirring noise and slippage for a few moments until the converter fills up with oil again. Actually, that's nothing to worry about. See if I got the story straight, Art. A constant slipping condition would usually indicate leakage past the regulator valve, right? Right, Bill, but don't rule out the possibility of clutch slippage. You better tell them about those O-rings used to seal the connections of the oil passages, Art. Right, Tech. You'll find O-rings between the engine and the adapter and between the adapter and the torque converter housing. There are small aligning sleeves between the housing and the adapter to hold the O-rings in place. If those O-rings aren't put in right, you might get an external oil leak or an internal leak. Mm -hmm. 
Just how would you spot these leaks? Well, an external leak might show up between the engine and the adapter plate. Coming from the O-ring between the adapter and the engine, or from the plug in the converter housing oil passage, right? That's right, Bill. Now, if you find oil in the torque converter housing or in the clutch housing, it may be coming from the O-rings, from the converter hub seal, or from the rear main bearing. These are internal leaks. Oil in the clutch housing could be leaking from the pressure regulator valve plug or from the turbine shaft seal, couldn't it? That's right, Bill. Well, looks like everything is under control, so I might as well run along. I hope Art and I have given you boys a good idea of just what makes this torque converter tick. And if you ever have occasion to disassemble this unit, you'll find all the information you need right in this reference book. Thanks a lot for giving Bill and me the story on this new unit, Tech. Drop back again, anytime. <laughs>